This meeting session is being recorded. Grab this. Let the awesomeness begin. Let, oh, awesomeness. Wow. I thought you said the optimist. <laughs> God. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible that my brain works that way. I thought you were talking about Transformers. I have a Transformers oh. filter on. Hold on. Let me shut that off. Yeah. yeah. So, nah, whatever. Uh, hi, Rob. I have an awesomeness. Hey, Jersey. How, 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 are you, how, are, how are you doing? <laughs> I said a personal back. Oh. Oh. Jinx, owe me, a, owe me a, a caffeinated beverage. Oh, I, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, See, you made this sweet presentation. You doing? must be doing pretty good. Oh, gosh, yeah. This is, if, if you can make presentations, that's the height of luxury. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, well, maybe it is. Maybe it is a sign of being a first world citizen if you got time to put together a bunch of slides to show somebody. So. Yep. Got time to talk about stuff I did. <laughs> Look at the thing I made. Look at the thing I made, right? Um, do we want to just jump into that? Do we want to talk about the topic, or did we have anything else that we wanted, any housekeeping uh, or other uh, things that we wanted to um, Let's broach. jump for it. Let's, jump. let's go for it. Um, we'll, uh, I think we'll, we'll work in other news and stuff along the way, if it makes sense. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about um, thumbnailing today because I'm hip deep in thumbnailing a new project, and uh, a lot of observations to make on that. And in, in being midway, well, two thirds of the way through thumbing a new book, and uh, what happens to you emotionally? What happen? Well, what what choices you're making? How do you compartmentalize the creative process, or at least how I do it? Uh, from from what, my standpoint and what I can share about that and how I make it manageable so it doesn't eat me alive because when you're facing a new page um, or a new project, there's a million things you got to tackle, right? And so the only way I've been able to do it without cracking up is by breaking it into uh, components of concern. Um, and I didn't used to do this. I mean, I've got some, actually, i got some material I can show off here. Oh, man, so many folders. I was digging through some of my old stuff last night in preparation. Oh, I'm hitting the mic like crazy. Sorry, everybody. And I have here the very first page of the front that I ever published. Now, I did front comics in high school that I never showed anybody, but this is the first page of art that I ever did that actually went into a published book just on typing paper and just with pencil. I inked with pencil back then. I just penciled really hard. And... Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I was making it up as I went along. You can see I didn't even pre-roll my pages. Like, all I did was I, like, sort of fudged where the panel borders should fall and kind of that's figured it out. That's a pretty tight best. layout. Huh? Uh, that's a pretty tight layout. And, uh, obviously, tight pencils, too. It's funny. There's a smudge mark across all the pages in the same spot where I think it was going through a, uh, a copy machine. <laughs> sure. Because I did, not, I did not put any fixative on these pages. But um, but anyway, so like these back in those days, this would be oh 1994. So so right on the paper. Uh, how long ago was that? Oh, um, we're clo closing in on 20 years. Um, so Thanks we'll for that. Um, yeah. but anyway, back then, cool. back then, back then I I would just draw the page and I'd write it as I was drawing it, and I didn't know what was going to be on the next page until I got there. And this worked fine. Uh, well, I, won't, I won't say it worked fine because the, the old books are not very good. And, I mean, there's, there's moments, there's points here and there where I go, oh, the kid kind of had some stuff figured out by this point. But do they work as a story? They're not very readable. They're not very entertaining. And they're not very well crafted. But I was getting books done. I, I got seven or almost eight issues done of that, of that book writing in that way. And then I got to a point where... I realized that I left a lot of things that I referred to in issue three sort of fall away, and I never referred to them again. Like, I, I, I was doing, like, foreshadowing of something that was going to happen soon, and then four issues later, I still haven't touched on it. And when I went back and looked at what I did, I didn't even know where I was going with that, you know, because I had no notes or anything. Um, I need to be a professional writer, then, if that's the case. <laughs> Is that what a professional... Never tie off? Yeah, I think that's a... I think that's a hallmark of a of a writer's career. I'm just totally joking. <laughs> I, think, I don't know. I know that there's been series that I've watched. I mean, I think like I don't know, uh, 
Farscape comes to mind, but I can't think of like the plot thread. It's just when different writers come in or, or people, you know, they change their minds and, and something more important, more fun, more dramatic comes up. Actually, no, I mean, in, in defense of, of writing um, on the fly, I remember hearing an interview with the writers of the Beast Horse cartoon series that when they started season one, they didn't know if the characters were on Earth or not because Hasbro wouldn't give them an answer on that. You know, they were writing about a series about a line of toys. Hasbro didn't even know what they wanted to do with these toys yet, so they really didn't have a premise. So they were inventing the premise as they wrote the show. And then in season two, when this big thing happens and it becomes definitive whether or not it's Earth, um, then they said they said the next problem was they had to like write themselves out of a corner because they had established so many things in season one that that left it ambiguous and kind of leaned toward it not being Earth. Uh, that now they were in a writing pickle, had to figure out a lot of things to fix a lot of the things. So they, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the cool stuff that happens in season two. Season two of Beast Wars, 1997. I've said it before. I've said it, I'll say it again. It almost made my life worth living. It was almost that awesome to me. I mean, it's like it's all I thought about in the fall of 1997. Um, yet so much of it was improvised, right? So you can work that way. And I'm not saying that you have to plan everything ahead, but one of the things that happened to me was in writing that way, I and I think this was A, me being an inexperienced writer, and B, uh, not having any kind of vision or plan or scope or even knowing what I wanted to do with this thing, um, I got to a point in the story where it just kind of, it just fell apart. It fell apart in, in, in terms of construction, in terms of how I was even thinking about it. It was just a mess, and I didn't know what, how to pick up the pieces and put it back together. And then I said, well, I'll put it on a shelf for a little while, and I'll get back to it when the inspiration strikes me. And that was in 1996. I didn't work on that story again until 1999, 2000. That's when I picked up the pencil again to work on it. So you're talking about like a four, five-year gap um, where I was waiting for the inspiration. And then what happened in 1999 was I said, well, if I'm going to do this, I don't want that to happen again. So I'm going to pre-plan as much as possible. So um, anyway, that's a long way of saying is that my, my approach to thumbnailing has changed a lot over the years. Uh, or it's, it's kind of oscillated back and forth between going really tight, really pre-planned, to being very improvisational and having fun with it. So um, I don't know. Where, where's your point of curiosity on this? Well, um, so you mentioned like in, this may be either recently or sort of in between or, or toward the beginning uh, as far as when you were doing your, your penciling and how your, your writing style and process changed. But uh, the phrase that came to mind, you didn't say this, but it's like when you look at a page and it's like you're, look, you're staring in, and it's blank and you're looking into the infinite void. And what are you going to do to fill that void? And, uh, and it sounds, I was curious if, if in the beginning when you're sort of you know, just, just free-spirited pencil inking style and all that kind of stuff did, did that matter did that slow you down no did that change no no as a matter of fact I think it it um, it's more terrifying now than it was then um, one of the things that I don't think this was on my mind at the time but I think it was probably there subconsciously someplace was uh, nobody knew who I was I was nobody and so it didn't matter as much what I put down on that page I could do this for purely for my own pleasure um, and, and that's really, I had this, and I've said this in other places on other podcasts, is I had this, this sort of um, a liberate, liberating arrogance about it. I know how to do this. I can do this thing. And, you know, this isn't that hard. And that naivete allowed me to just, you know, brazenly just come in and throw lines on a page and get stuff done. Um, there was nothing heroic about it. It was purely ego. It was purely me saying that I, I think I'm good at this thing and I want to have fun doing it. Um, and because nobody was watching, I didn't feel so pressured to do a good job of it, right? I wanted to do a good enough job to make me happy. And did I walk away from every book going, like, this is the best thing ever? No, no, not of course I didn't. But I, I felt satisfied by the experience doing it. Nowadays, now that I've done a few things that people have looked at, and, and I've made a lot of you know noise about, I know how to do this stuff, and I'll share my experiences with you, I feel a lot more pressure now to do a really good job because i I got to practice what I preach, right? So if I do a crumb, crumb bum story and there's countless hours of me talking about how to make a good story, it's, I got a lot more at stake, at stake nowadays than I did then. At least my, I perceive that, right? Maybe I don't. But, but so staring at a blank page and jumping in seemed like a natural thing to do back then. I don't know if that was a good character trait or a bad character trait. I don't, I don't even know if, the, if it needs a judgment, but that's just the way it was. 
No, yeah, I'm not really looking at good or bad. I just, uh, I was curious if it was harder than, or, or if it sort of, you know, you just went, you know, uh, it was super easy, then it, you know, became more difficult, and then got easier, or, or you know, it did, how did that go back and forth? Because it sounds like your process uh, evolved, but um, yeah, uh, um, you know, I'd like to think that. When I was when I was a kid, a kid starting out, so this is like nineteen or early twenties. Um, I didn't know how to construct a story. I didn't know how to make a series of events that added up to a point, and I didn't know how to communicate character very well. But I had an idea on it. And I had like a, I, I could hear voices of my characters, and I could express it somewhat through my story. But I wasn't, you know, it wasn't polished. It was very raw. But I had a sense of and I don't know if this comes out of reading comics or studying comics, or I was making comics all throughout from like fifth grade all through high school. I made comics about my friends. I made comics about my own characters, you know, so I was always, always making comics. So I had, you know, some practice, even though school was trying to beat it out of me. Uh, we could go into that at a later date. Um, so I think I had, I had at least like an ear for it. Let me put it that way. You know, I couldn't read tablature, but I could, I could hear a tune and like strum it out, that kind of idea. And uh, we're, so, so that part came easy, but when it got hard was when I started working with Tom Root. Now I've said this again, uh, uh, you know, I'm just for those who are listening who want to say, hey, we've heard this before. Yeah, I've said this before. Um, working with Tom Root for those, oh, I think it was like I worked with him for like two or three, maybe four years. It was my what I call my graduate course in writing. He taught me a lot about writing, uh, and I don't, and it wasn't a didactic kind of teaching. It was just through working with him and discussing these stories with him. And watching his editing process go, I picked up a lot of really useful ideas on how to construct a story. And the, the case in point was when, um, and this goes back to something we talked about last episode, um, this idea of like putting ourselves in, in creative boxes. I'm a penciler, that's all. I just don't do that. Um, when, I, when I wanted to work on the front again after my uh, aborted attempt in the, in the early to mid-90s, I approached Tom Root to help me write a new treatment for it, a new version. That what became, and I can hold it up for the camera because I actually have it on my desk, this guy here. And I actually approached Tom to say, like, would you help me write this thing? Because I'm not very good at, at the actual dialogue and scripting. Tom, you write really funny jokes. You're really great at character voice. Could you help me with this? And he's like, well, let's hear your pitch. Let's hear you talk about, you know, what the story is about. And so I started describing the, the main bad guy in the story, Hook, and I said, and I sat there going, well, he's kind of like this, and he's kind of like that. He's a little bit of this, he's a little bit of that. And, and Tom's very patiently sat there listening, and then he kind of nodded and said, so you don't know who this guy is, do you? <laughs> you know, and, and it, it, you'd have to know Tom. He has like a very dry wit, and it didn't hurt me at all. Like I, it actually, you know, it, I erupted in laughter. I was like, yeah, you're right. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about right now. So he did a lot of that kind of stuff, a lot of uh, listening to me, hem and haw, and then go. And very simply saying, well, that doesn't need to be in there, does it? Because you just said this, right? So I, I picked up a lot from him. And that made thumbnailing harder because it made me a lot more mindful of what I was doing in the story. Um, and I actually have, I think I've got in this presentation thing. This is where people will want to watch the videos. So, yeah, like the way Tom and I worked... The way we did, uh, we switched back and forth between full script and what they call plot style um, comics creation. And this is where I get to do a little bit of a, oh, what do they call this, a scoop. Uh, this has never been seen before by anybody. Uh, in looking through my notes, I found an old comic from 1996 that Tom and I did together as a pitch. Or uh, pitched around to some different companies trying to get it published. And I drew the whole darn thing, and I think, and I think he literally paid me in Transformers. <laughs> he he gave me uh, some some of his old Transformers and like a whole bunch of old Transformers memorabilia that like when he showed it to me in the trunk of his car, I think I caught him off guard with how excited I got. It was like old Transformers notebooks, a Transformers pencil case that I use to this day. I use it to keep my crayons in for when I go to conventions to do crayon sketches. Um, so yes, I I I once drew a comic for Transformers. <laughs> That's so sad. And you know what? I actually, um, I'd, uh, I'd done a lot of uh, artwork, you know, through el you know elementary and junior and high school and whatnot. But I hadn't uh, hadn't focused as much on storytelling as you know, with you. I, mean, I, I think I focused on on maybe assets I could use in role playing games and stuff. 
but nothing okay. as much you know, cohesive for you know, telling stories as comics and whatnot. But I did, you know, go off and on in, uh, with an interest in comics, and I happen to have this Wolverine one laying around, and it was one where there's a dude that's reaching up to Wolverine's Wolverine shirt, and it's very dark and shadowy and stuff, and um, that was inspired by it, and I was a kind of an angsty teen at the time. So anyway, I did a, a, a bit of fan art for this. And anyway, I traded it for a butterfly knife. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool when you like that is a form of commerce, right? Trade is a form of commerce and so, you know, this was this could be considered my well, this wouldn't be my first professional gig. But it was the first time where I negotiated a contract where I said, like, well, Tom said, would you like to do this story with me? I said, sure, but I time is limited. We gotta work out some kind of payment arrangement and he's like, Well, would you do it for Transformers? And so you made art, you traded it to somebody for a knife. That was a commercial transaction, right? I think that's the first time I got paid then, come to think of it. <laughs> you got paid in a knife. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so crackin' well, out Dundee. Transformers. That's cool. I mean, at least, you know. Well, it just, it just goes to show that I'm completely a one-note guy, and I've always been this way. <laughs> <laughs> I have not grown as a human being. As a storyteller, yes, but as a human being, no. I'm still the, the same person I was when I was, you know, 11. Um, but anyway, um, I had a side note that I wanted to go into about this 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 comic, this Stranger Things. So for those who aren't, um, you know, watching the video, this is a comic I did in 1996 with Tom Root called Stranger Things, and it was very early in my development as an artist. I was clearly trying to emulate a combination of Keith Giffen and Eric Larson. Those were my two muses at that time. And I posted the entire comic on uh, comicsaregreat.com. It's at a post. It's comicsaregreat.com slash stranger-things is where you can find the, the link to the, the full, you know, with some thoughts on, on what went into this comic and what I think about it now. Even posted some of the thumbnails on that post as well. Um, so anyway, you can look at that while you're listening or for later follow-up. Anyway, uh, but the, the, the thing that occurred to me as I was digging through my notes and I found this book, and I was like, I had not thought about this book in years. And, uh, and I was like, oh, I wonder if I should post it on my blog. It's like unpublished work. And then when I thought of that, the word unpublished seemed like such a strange word to me nowadays. And this is where I have changed as a person, is I was thinking about how in 1996, when we did this book, we had to hunt around for, for somebody's permission to put it in front of people, right? We had to get somebody to back us financially to print it and distribute it. Otherwise, it may as well not exist. And when publishers turned us down, and I got some very discouraging remarks from some publishers about my art, and looking at it, yeah, it needs a lot of work. Um, but it's all part of the gig is, you know, taking that, those kind of hits from somebody. It's like, well, Jersey needs to work really hard on his anatomy. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what happened was is after we got turned down by everybody, our, our only recourse was to put it on a shelf. You know, I guess we, we could have done it as a mini comic and taken it to shows that way, but that was like a much more time intensive and laborious process for something that is not your baby. Right. This was something we we're trying to just pitched as a like a, a series, like a TV series kind of deal. Right. So yeah, it's, a, it's an act of commerce. I mean, you're saying, hey, this is a bit of content that you can sell for your business. I want to make money off of it. And uh, yeah. And so and so back then, your only choice was put it on a shelf. You know, you, there's, there's very few ways to actually get it in front of people. And here I am in 2011. And I look at it, and I'm like, why aren't, why am I not sharing this? I mean, obviously, it's nothing I'm going to finish. I mean, it's only one issue. Um, Tom has expressed no interest in working on it ever again. Uh, well, who knows? Maybe he'll catch wind that I posted online, and if it gets like a lot of attention. And this is the thing that this leads me to what my point was: is that nowadays it's like you can test fly anything you want, and the only difference between published and unpublished is whether or not you feel comfortable sharing it. What a difference between now and just 15 years ago, right? How much has changed in that, you know, to a kid, I guess that's a long time ago, like I think about my students, and they're like, yeah, it was two when you made this book, right? But to us, that's that's a blink of an eye, 15 years. Uh, and and perceptions have changed so much in that respect. So that, that, that was the only takeaway. I don't know if you had anything that you wanted to throw on top of that. We're a participatory, participatory culture episode also, yeah. because uh, it was ingrained that the idea of something being widespread, something broadcasted to the general populace, something available in mass was um, 
provided through a, a, a big institution. Yeah. Publisher, television station, radio, record, whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter whatever the creative medium, there was some central big source that you had to work through. And now you really don't. And, and, but even though that, that more or less, I mean, they coexist now. And I think that's, that could be kind of healthy because you, you sort of have a, a wider cultivation of and encouragement of creative work, theoretically, right? Because mm -hmm. more people would participate in the lesser known stage, right? Right, because, right. Because well, that can, can possibly be known and have some kind of audience. It's either, it's, it's, it's far less of an all or nothing nowadays. Yes. Hey, it's it's a but, it's a but, more. Yeah. And I, I anyway, it makes sense of how that is still pretty ingrained in a lot of people, that that idea because it's not that old where it's not that long ago where that was the case. Um, you weren't published unless someone else published you. And, and and there's still people who feel that way, you know. I mean, like you said, you know, it's still ingrained. Uh, I just I just caught a review. Somebody actually wrote a review of, uh, or actually it was a podcast review of the Comics Are Great show, and I broke my own rule and listened to it. You know, it's like I, I said to myself, I try to avoid reading anything that's been written about me because I just don't want it to affect what I do. Um, and uh, good or bad, you know, I, I, I want to remember that remember that Caesar, thou art mortal, but at the same time, I also don't want to hear somebody say, as they always do, something about my laughter, you know, and this review said something about my laughter. He laughs at everything, even things that aren't funny, you know. Oh, yeah. Sorry I laugh, everybody. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry that I laugh. If you don't like my laugh, if you don't like my laughter, then there's this great thing called the stop button, and uh, you, there's uh, good news is there's tons and tons of other great podcasts about the stuff we talk about, you know, or you listen to the radio or watch TV, read a book, you know, you don't have to listen to me laugh. Nobody has to. I don't, um, it's, it's hard to, when, when there's something out there that you think could be some valuable feedback, you know, like I, I don't believe in horoscopes, but I'll still read them if they, if it comes across my, you know, like my placemat at a restaurant, I'll, I'll read it or <laughs> yeah. but I won't go out and seek it, right? Um, yeah. I don't know. Un, un, no. Un, no. Good point. Uncontextualized critique can be, I don't know, I guess it's a lot like a horoscope. But the, the other thing about this, this review was, is that this person said, like, you are not going to recognize any of the names of anybody who's on a show. It's like it's like talking to a bunch of obscure indie cartoonists. And that caught me off guard. That ca that made me go, wow, really? Because, like, these people, to me, are, like, super important. Like, I, like okay, so the next comics are great. I've got Nick Abadzis and uh, Jim Ottaviani. Uh, Nick Abadzis did the Leica graphic novel for First Second. I've gone on record that, that I think First Second is the Pixar of comics right now. Everything they do is a home run, and it's really, even if you aren't interested in the subject matter, if you read it, it's a really, really good story. Um, and Jim Taviani, Ottaviani, I always screw that guy's name up. You'll hear me say it right on Wednesday because uh, I'm going to ask him to correct me. Um, you know, he, he did uh, T Minus, Suspended in Language, the new book Feynman. He does all these biographies about scientific heroes, and, um, you know, Suspended in Language is the story of Niels Bohr. Um, but anyway, so like I'm super stoked to get these guys in, in the same room, so to speak, to talk about comics. And to me, these guys are stars and like not in that ironic way where it's like, you know, that obscure band that you like. Well, they're my superstars because they're mine and nobody knows about them. Not that way. Like I just it, it really occurs to me, like, it really goes through my mind. Like I'm so lucky that I get to get these big names on my show to talk to these guys because they're really they're doing really important work in comics. And I can't wait to pick their brain about it. But to a substantial part of the public, because I haven't had Tom DeFalco, Jim Lee, Jeff Johns, um, I don't know, Steve McNiven or whoever on the show, and it's not that I don't want to, it's just that it hasn't occurred to me yet, that's, to them, that's still the world of comics. And it, and it reminded me of how, how d departed I am from that world and how my perceptions as a cartoonist have changed in the last 10 years, you know, where it's not me being a rebel saying, oh, I'm an indie guy, I only support and respect indie people. No, it's just that I've be my attention is so focused in such a different part of the comics landscape and a different, co part, different province of the comics country, so to speak, that I've forgotten that there's other provinces that aren't even aware of the existence of this one, right? 
And it, it's a reminder to me, too, that I want to get more people from that other province on my show to do what little bit I can to sort of level that whole uh, perception. It's like make, people, make these different continents or countries or provinces aware of one another, both in terms of the cartoonists and the readers of this work. So anyway, I don't know how I got on that. That was that was a really spirally little rabbit hole. I'm glad you elaborated on that because I mean, more or less, that's like the that's like the Jersey Droves agenda without you know getting. The, I'll I'll make it extra explicit. I mean, and you can just correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it's it, it's actually neat to hear that because uh, well, one of my one of the things that that um, studying too many different things and being like, for me, I, I focus on like, well, what's the how and how do I bring this thing about or whatever. And I know one of my weaknesses is knowing more about the personalities and the people and the ecosystem behind the creative disciplines and that are producing the viable works and all that. What's neat is, is um, uh, I, I like how, it's funny, I'm patting you on the back soon. So people, I, I, I dig what Jersey does. So that's why that, that's the reason why I work with them. But that, that's like thanking me for eating breakfast, though. You know, I mean, it's like it's like it, it's it's not it's not something that that is it's not something that is like a, a, a something I had to work hard to do, or is that like a like a, a moral struggle of any kind? It's just like, well, duh, yeah, we all should be aware that it's all comics, and these divisions are artificial. And uh, I I get just as excited about seeing a really cool superhero pose drawn by like Jim Lee or something as I do about reading a biography of Richard Feynman. By uh, Jim Mataviani, Adaviani. Uh, now everybody's gonna remember his name because I keep mispronouncing it. Uh, just because they both do really excellent comics, you know. So I don't know. There's nothing to be congratulated for. It's just I'm, I'm not trying to over congratulate. It's just neat to hear that explicitly, where it's like, oh yeah, well, it's just because it's all comics, and yeah. it's just stepping back and seeing it as that, as opposed to that what. That the perception that causes that to where someone says, well, that's not valid because these aren't really common. They're trying to um, categorize it based on yeah. the traditional industry perspective. Yeah, yeah, no. It's In, been highly. Um, that's one of the uh, things that they're really good at. They're they're good at branding, right? I mean, so DC, Marvel, and DC's big New Fifty Two, and all that stuff. People know about that. All sorts of people that in my life did, did, didn't really pay attention to comics much at all. Like you do comics. Yeah. Well, what do you think of this DC 52 thing and whatnot? So they have this voice in, uh, um, uh, at a large scale throughout society that, uh, mm -hmm. that they can use. And then obviously that'll have some kind of focus and where people are thinking of them related to the topic. Yeah. And, and it's, in the circles I travel through, I notice that there's a lot of disparity in terms of who knows what about what in, in terms of like who's aware of what's happening in different circles of comics. So like I, I do a lot of work with educators and librarians. When I say the name Raina Telgemeier to them, they're like, oh, do you know her? You know, there's like this this hush silence. I'm like, yeah, she's been in my house. And they're like, oh, wow, you know, because she's a star to those people. And then I talk to some of my friends who I grew up with who still go to their local comic store every Wednesday and they're buying all this DC and Marvel stuff. And I say, uh, you know, oh, Dave Roman's got a new book out. It's called Teen Boat. And they're like, who's Dave Roman? I'm like, dude, you know, he, he's working for first second and he's getting all this acclaim and attention for his books in these circles. Yes, but these, these two regions are largely unaware of one another. And it's not, thankfully, most of the people I know don't sneer at the other side. You know, it's just that they're just unaware of it. They're, they're just not, they're, they're ignorant of what's happening elsewhere. They have their little pond and, or province or whatever you want to call it. And uh, it's not that they're being provincial, <laughs> using province as a word. It, it, it's that they're just unaware of like, oh, there's, there's more towns. Oh, I'll have to go there, you know, so. And but, honestly, I'm fairly well in that zone right now where I'm like, I'm, I'm excited about learning about the more towns and the more, and the, and the different uh, things that I can learn from all these different practitioners at the yeah. different levels. And, uh, you know, taking a fresh look at, well, why did I like Ghost Rider and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's fun. And, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, never been that guy to be able to quote all the names of all the people that do neat stuff. That I like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm not that great at it either. Um, I'm the kind of guy who will have to hear somebody's name three times before it really sticks. Um, anyway, thumbnailing. Uh, 
So I don't know how we got down that little rabbit hole, but that was fun. Uh, so this particular book, this is the reason I decided that it was worth sharing on the show, is that this one, Tom and I worked from full script, where he sent me a fully realized typewritten script of what's happening on the page. So here we got page one, full, you know, full bleed, and he's describing the scene. Jungle, thick foliage uh, draped over gnarled branches, vegetation knit so tightly and the sunlight never reaches the ground. There's an unhealthy glow here. <laughs> i got to do this in black and white. Thanks, Tom. In the foreground is Laura, crouched beside the trunk of a decaying tree, fingernails digging into the soft bark, one knee sinking into the mud. Her eyes are wide and frightened, her clothing wet and stained. Her hair is tangled, matted, clinging to her cheeks and forehead. And then... Uh, I believe exposition is what the EXP stands for, and this is her caption boxes. Pray, not the first time, I think, but the familiar, familiar, familiarity of this unspooling dream lends no peace to my trembling fingers, no calm to my frantic heart, for as many times as I found myself staring in this horror film, starring in this horror film, I realize I've never seen the ending. So there's page one described to me, and now it's time for me to thumb it. Now, back then, I thumbed really loose, as you can see. I mean, I have basically a stick and bubble figure with no facial expression. Uh, and the vaguest, you know, sketch lines to represent a background and a sense of perspective. But uh, back then, it was just more about, like, capturing a sense of composition. And Is that the, a full-page size uh, sketch, Jersey? Oh, good question. Yes. So here's where we can do some visual examples of how I did thumbnailing back then because I brought some visual aids. We're talking letter size paper folded in half uh, portrait. Hey, and there's the cover to the front number three thumbnailed. Or the front part, chapter three. So anyway. Uh, but yes, so back then I would just take regular you know, copy paper, fold it in half, staple it with my long arm stapler, and I would sketch it out at half of that, so half the size of uh, eight and a half by eleven. Um, got a teaser. Nowadays, I'm doing them even smaller. This is Holly Hammerhands number one. So anyway, uh, yeah, I would do it that size, and then I would pencil and quote unquote ink the pages uh, eleven by seventeen or ten by fifteen would be the live area, ten inches by fifteen inches, which was standard comics illustration board size back then. Um, but I would just buy, you know, off-the-shelf cardstock or, uh, what am I trying to say, Bristol. Uh, I wouldn't get, like, any name brand stuff, and I would pre I'd rule my pages myself. And um, I got an example here. Okay, yeah, here's a comparison. So there's before and after. So this was kind of leaping off of what I was doing on my mini-comics at that time where I was, like, writing as I went. I was still drawing as I went. I really wasn't doing a whole lot at the thumbnailing level except figuring out the pose. And this was partially um, to because I was working with a writer, because Tom needed to see what my previs was going to be before he actually saw the finished pages, before I put seven or eight hours into a page of comics illustration. And I actually have actual thumbs that you're looking at in the presentation. Um, sometimes Tom would give me edits where he would put a little sticky note to show what he really wanted off, you know, from my thumbnail. So, like, originally... This shot was um, looking behind the character as the character as another character creeps up on him, and Tom said, "No, flip it around so that we're looking at his face and we see her creeping up behind him." And put a little post-it note with a crude drawing on there. He, does, he did that a lot with my thumbs, uh, sort of acting as editor, right? So, like, you know, I put a little note in there, you know, more intense, intimidating. You know, he's about to use superpowers here. He shouldn't look so happy about it, or something like that. Uh, so yeah, so this was partially in response to having to give the writer, my, my creative partner, a chance to inject something into this and like, do a round of editing before we went to finals. Uh, and Tom did the lettering too on this, and um, I'm uh, looking back, I'm really pleased with his sense of uh, placement. His word balloon and caption box placement is really good. But then... We get to this, here's an example of how, here's the thumbnail version where Laura is woken from her dream and looking out of the city during sunrise and feeling sad, uh, and I went a completely different direction between the thumbnail and the final. Uh, looking at it now, I think if I would have gone with the, uh, I don't know which one I like better, because the first one is looking from behind Laura at her reflection in the window and then a one-point perspective of the city spiral or spanning out in front of her 
Um, the one I did instead was looking from the city into her apartment window and seeing the city spanning out behind her window. I don't know which one I like better, but I guess it doesn't matter. I mean, it's 15 years ago or whatever. Convey different feelings. Yeah. I think I think I went for the the shot that gave me the most artistic oomph. This is me showing off. Look at how detailed I can go, you know. Whereas I think the initial thumbnail with looking over her shoulder at her reflection as she looks at the city is probably more moody. So probably the first first version would have worked better in the context of what Tom was going for there. I think it was also a situation where I probably didn't know how to do a reflection like that when just pure black and white with pencil. You know, I wasn't skilled enough as an illustrator yet. So, anyway, okay, so, you know, we did this full script version, and Tom reported that he thought it worked better when he just gave me page descriptions without dialogue and just let me sort of do what I wanted with it and sort of introduce my own ideas. And he began to trust me more as a partner on this. And so the next, one of the next things we did was something called, a miniseries called PPV, which is actually uh, online. You can read that one for free. I'll link to it in the show notes. I don't have the link with me now. It's on a site called Comic Works, and I need to put it on my own site as well. But uh, he would send me emails, and we're looking at an email now, uh, where he would just say, you know, here's the first half of the plots. That's what we call it, you know. It's plot-style writing, so he'd give me a plot. Uh, page two, the kids watching the fight are cheering for their favorites. Victor's gang is cheering Victor while everyone else is cheering Evan. However, they're so lost in their cheering that they aren't standing in their respective groups. They're all interspersed far away on the alien home world. The aliens in the bar are cheering on their favorites too. Victor swoops down at Evan and gets ready, thinking he'll just keep dodging and he'll be fine. But pow, instead Victor kicks him right through the wall. So that's essentially what needs to happen on the page. And then it's up to me to figure out the pacing of that moment and introduce any other storytelling moments that might work. And if, if you're looking at the video, you'll see that as I'm reading this, I'm also jotting down moment choices. Like I'm, I started sketching. There's a scene where Evan, uh, during the fight with Victor, grabs one of Victor's trophies from the trophy case in the school and threatens to destroy it. And, you know, and I thought it would be really cool if he did this whole like, hold it right there and like hold it up between him and Victor as Victor's coming at him. And so I sketched it out real quick with a ballpoint pen. Also, making notes on the email that I got from him, saying, like, here's the things i got to start looking up pictures from. I started to look up locker room, trophy case, soda machine, start thinking about what's in these lockers, um, because that was going to be part of the story. And here's an example of Tom trusting me. So, in, in uh, the third issue, he says, page four. So I had this crazy idea here. I want Victor to grab Evan, say something snide, and then smash him through a series of lockers. Like Victor forces him through one locker after another, and we see it as a cutaway as each new locker is full of a new batch of junk. Crash, 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 locker, locker after locker. I don't know if it's a cutaway of each locker, or if it's a cutaway or each locker door springs open or what. The problem? I have no idea how to storyboard something like this. Give, let me know what you think. At any rate, it ends with Evan crashing through a glass trophy case on the wall. So see, this is a situation where he knew what he wanted. He knew how he wanted it to feel. He had even a sense of rhythm. Crash, 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 crash. But he didn't know how to visualize it. So that's where I had a lot of latitude. And so, you know, I would let him know if I could pull it off or not. I would give him a thumbnail. And you could see, uh, if, again, if you're watching video, um, that I'm sketching it out right next to the paragraphs. Each paragraph is a description of a page, and I do like a very loose stick figure version of the thumbnail as I'm visualizing what he's describing. And this is definitely, this is closer to an actual thumbnail size. I mean, it's probably uh, yeah. what, one inch by two inches, maybe. Yeah, I can actually pull up the, I think I've still got the, uh, the notes out, or maybe not. <clears throat> Where the ding dong is it? Oh, it's right here. I'm holding it in my hand as I say that. You know, <laughs> it's like this. Where's my glasses? That old joke? You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Here's the the page in question. So there's my finger. You know, it's like what, like maybe an inch and a half deep. It's a very tiny sketch. So right there. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that that's this was also this helped develop my method of thumbnailing for the next couple of years because working on this book, this really was this this book was a really important event in my life in a lot of ways. Uh, it was my first miniseries. It almost killed me because it made me really sick because I worked really hard on it 
And uh, I learned a ton about storytelling from this. And I learned how to ink with a crow quill. This was where I test drove that for the first time. So, you know, this this was my my summer, that, that summer that you never forget kind of thing, <laughs> working on this book. Um, but yeah, so I would start with like this really, really tiny thumb, and then I would take it to half of a letter size thumbnail, and then I would scan those and send those to Tom for review. And then he'd give me the same kind of notes that he did with Stranger Things, and then I'd go to Final, which was 11 by 17 Bristol. Um, it's a fairly traditional process. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? Fairly yeah. And, and just to describe, talking about breaking into realms of concern, when I'm thumbing small, like as we're looking at on the screen with the little tiny inch and a half thing next to the paragraph description, I'm really thinking about two things. One, moment choice, and two, paneling. How are the panels going to interact, and what are the essential moment choices there? I'm not thinking about body language. I'm not thinking about acting. I'm not thinking about perspective. I'm not even thinking about line choices all that much, right? I'm just thinking about how are these shapes going to interact to create a sense of rhythm. So when I read Tom's description, crash, 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 that's going to have a staccato rhythm. It's going to be a series of four panels that are roughly the same size, and they got to happen in a row, you know? And you can see that in the thumbnail that I just did the boxes. Like I drew Evan's face smashing through the first locker and then just repeated some boxes in ditto-style fashion, like in again, again, again. Um, when I go to the second round of thumbs, where I'm revising and improving upon the first draft. Um, and actually, I got an example here of that, too. So I took this to when I was working on the front, where I would take, again, letter size sheet of paper, fold it in half, staple it, but then I would put inch and a half, two inch uh, size thumbnails on there, doing the same kind of thing, just figuring out the basic moment choices and writing the essential script along the side, not worrying about trying to fit it in the panels, right? And so, again, just figuring out, like, the, the visual rhythm, the sense of rhythm of the panels, and then the rhythm of the moment choices at that, at that stage, and not really drawing anything. Because, like, here's, here's um, Thirsty falling to the ground in this panel here, right? I didn't even finish drawing his body. And that moment became... Page three of the book, page two of the book, right? So that became this moment there, which, you know, at the final stage, you're working on drawing it right, anatomy, body language, acting moments, gesture, line, all those things. But I'm not worried about it at this stage. This stage, I, the, the thumbnails, I'm just focused on, you know, really just two things, keeping it simple for myself so I don't crack up. So, yeah, and then I took a picture of... Uh, Everything that went into making the front trade paperback graphic novel. And there's the stack of paper there. This is my front rebirth folder with all the different iterations of the thumbnails. I go through these days. Well, at this time, I went through uh, upwards of three rounds of thumbnails in order to get to final. That's a good stack of paper. I mean, heck, I would call it what... Uh... Five inches or so, probably, is it like yeah. a good 10 pounds? It, it may be like five pounds. I mean, you can put it in perspective of like the book is actually thinner than the, the amount of notes and revisions that went into making it. I'm not doing this to show off. I'm just saying that I was, at this point, I was so scared of doing what I did before, of failing and not finishing the book or, you know, putting like two years of work into it and have it fall apart on me that I wanted to have everything written to the last you know, dotted I and cross T before I sat down to draw it. Um, so, so yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would sketch out the little tiny versions, then I would take it to a secondary version where, again, this is a letter size sheet of paper, and uh, I would do them as two ups per side, and then I would go through again and thumb it one more time as, and then that, and this is where I get to. This is where it gets complicated. So when I went to th to the final thumbs on this, I thought I was going to do it as a web comic, a pure web comic, where it would be unprintable. And I printed out this template, which each of these represents screen aspect ratio. Each of these boxes are three screens, or one screen, right? So I got three screens to a page of 8.5 by 11 paper, and I actually thumbed the entire thing as an infinitely scrolling 
story. Um, when I got to thumbing issue six, I decided, wait a second, I want to have this in print too. <laughs> so I, I quickly, uh, I thumbed the final chapter the normal way of, of um, you know, the eight and a half by 11 folded in half, like a little pretend book. Finding and that, uh, in print and whatnot, because uh, uh, there's, you don't have to have, so you're thinking of like a tra traditional manga or a traditional comic. Right. Ratio. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I wanted to do it as an infinite scroll that would take advantage of a lot of things McLeod was playing with at the time. This would be in like 2000, 2001, when Reinventing Comics was a fairly new book. Scott McLeod had his new uh, Zot comic on his website, which really took, it was, it was an infinitely scrolling comic that really took advantage of the cheap real estate to do some really interesting things with gutters, to create a sense of pacing. If you think about it, a page of a comic is really high-priced real estate. You've only got so much room in there to fit what you really need to get in there. And so you can't have, or at least you should, you should only do this for effect, have like really crazy, like a gutter between like, say, this panel and this panel and like have like two-thirds of the page be blank. That should only be done for effect, right? So on a web page, real estate is super cheap. You could do that all the time, and it's, the, the space is only limited to how fast can somebody scroll. Um, so I wanted to take advantage of that, but then I realized that in doing that, in laying out the whole story that way, I've made it, I would have to do a lot of reverse engineering to get all of that squeezed back onto a page and have it work to fit in a traditional manga size or comic size printing, right? So, yeah, so I went back on that, but then that meant that I had to literally reverse engineer. What? Say that again, Rob? We may have you having a little bit of lag, sorry. It, uh, I was just <laughs> mentioning it to, to say that it's possible to print something that's infinitely scrolling. It's just obviously you have a reformatting challenge, right? You, you picked... Basically, you, yeah. I think you end up picking your primary platform, if you will, right? So if your your pri your or your end target is you know, a traditional format manga or, or comic, that'll dictate um, how you lay out your comic, even if you do publish it as, as a web comic. But then, of course, if you pick infinitely scrolling, heavy duty trade offs will be made as far as yeah. printing. But uh, which that when I printed um, you know, my first four chapters of Art Geek Zoo, I had that challenge because I, I kept yeah. switching the layout of my comic. As I, as yep, I like the, yep, the, the page, like you have to read it in different directions or rather in different, different ratios when you start out to when you finish that collection. Right. And that, yeah. So like, yeah, you start out reading the book this way or no, it's like, is it like this first? And then you have to go like this. I don't know. Yeah, you have to go. You have to go from portrait to landscape or landscape to portrait, and like through reading the book, right? Yeah. Here's the funny thing, though, is that in in my um. In in the the here's the like the set round two thumbs on chapter five of the book that which I did in page format, right? Page layout. Then I transferred it to infinite canvas, and then. I had to transfer it again back to page because <laughs> I made revisions that I liked at this stage. So, it, are you it, redrawing everything every time? I'm wondering. I I did my thumb super tight back then too because this again was I was super worried about getting it right. So yeah, even like the loose small thumbs were pretty tight, right? And I'll, this is where I can show off the fact that um, everybody thinks that I actually have a vocabulary like the Brigadier Generals, and I wrote it in plain English and then translated it on the on the pages. You could see like the original text that I wrote, where I'd write his what he's essentially saying, and then I would go get my thesaurus and translate it into crazy supervillain talk. <laughs> so anyway, um, to finish the story, because I want to wrap this up, because I don't want to you know hog the whole thing. Yeah, there's there's the looking at the screen now. There's the loose two up thumbs, eight and a half by eleven paper folded in half, very loose sketches, but fairly detailed. You know, I'm actually like hinting at backgrounds in there. And then I translated it to this. Oh, let go of that. I don't know why, but my mouse is refusing to let go of the scroll handle. There we go. Uh, I translated it to infinite canvas version. See, in here, right in the middle, is an example of how I plan on playing with that cheap real estate of a web presence where you could have like panels stagger and sort of go down like a staircase and leave a lot of negative space 
and leading to the big reveal of scrolling down to the panel where Rex is screaming sword user, right? So, and then I rejiggered them back into the final pages. So you look at this page where the hook is dissipate or disappearing into the flames and then going to the panel where he screams sword user, it works, it's good, but I think the web version where you would have to scroll down to that panel and that panel is the entire sort of scene as it were, it takes up the whole screen, um, that would have had probably a little bit more oomph, right? Sure, yeah, it's more, far more emphasized. So, but one of the things I love about... Go ahead. Sorry, Rod. I don't know. They're just they're trade offs. I mean, in, in you seeing both options, you know, you can uh, I, you end up doing compromises for your format. You you know, the, it it's not like uh, you come up with a design that could somehow um, supersede the idea of trade offs. You'll always have trade offs. Yep. Your, your layout of uh, this is a um, traditional comic size, right? Yeah. Six by nine is the, yeah, the more the classic comic size. Um, so yeah, there's a comparison. I mean, you can look at the panel where Rex is screaming sword user in the thumbnail and it's like the pose isn't complete. All I know is that it's going to be him like screaming into the fire, right? Uh, and then you look at the final and it's changed quite a bit. You know, even deciding to have his hand crossing over the word balloon so as if he's he's reaching so hard that it's even you know sort of breaking the fourth wall a little bit, creating a, creating a sense of depth and creating a sense of uh, you know intensity and also a sense of that there's there's more noise here than just his voice too that kind of thing. But anyway, who knows if I did it? Uh, so okay, and then we'll get to the final part of my story. Um, then uh, in 2007, I started working on the Sugary Cereals project, and for this one, I went straight to um, eight and a half by eleven fold and half thumbs for the finals, and you will notice that these thumbs are a little looser than what I had done for the front. So if we go scroll up to the final thumbnails, these are pretty detailed, right? Look at that! Look at that shot of of Galen jumping through the window with all the crowd down there, and I bothered to draw all those little stick people. Why did I do that? I I, I had so little faith in my own abilities back then. I was so worried. I was so trying to protect myself from the future. Um, but by the time I finished, you know, two, several hundred, two graphic novels uh, uh, adding up to, you know, over 400 pages uh, total, I thought, okay, I know what I'm doing now, so now I'm going to relax and I'm going to have fun with this thing and go back to the way I did it, you know, in 1996, 1997. And uh, what I do in these cases is if I screw up, like this, this particular example from Equalizers of the Divide, um... I thumbed the first eight pages and decided it was crap. It was going completely in the wrong direction. I was trying to hit my points uh, too early on, and some of these things could be hinted at later on without me having to like front load the whole thing with like these are the characters and this is the situation. So all I did was uh, I just ripped out pages and taped new pages over top of the old ones. So I have both versions in case the first version winds up actually being okay upon reflection. But then I just, if you look at the actual, I don't think I have the thumbnails here with me. But um, I can pick up another one to show. So, like, if here, if this were the thumbnail of page one, I would just tear off a half sheet and just tape it over this, mm -hmm. right? And that would be my edit. That's the new version, and that's what the first eight pages of this story I did. So that's why when you look at the scan here, it's actually torn out pages. So, but these days I also do the final dialogue at the final thumbs too. 99% of the time I stick with this dialogue. I very rarely change it anymore because I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about both at once. So I added a new layer of concern to it. I'm thinking about moment choice and paneling. I'm thinking about, in a rough sense, what the body language is going to be. Um, but and then I'm also thinking about uh, word bloom placement and final dialogue at this stage. And I think this just came out of practice. So there's the thumbnails next to the pencils. We're obviously you can see that I tightened up considerably between the thumbnail and the final pencil. Or better examples right here. Uh, but there look, was no stage in between. Nope, these. nothing in between these two, right? Like the tree that Ren is standing on here in the thumbnail, I didn't know if it was going to be that gnarled, knotty thing until I got to the pencil stage. 
like at the pencil stage, I said, well, I got to make this tree look exotic somehow. Well, what if it looks like, like really naughty, you know? And then, you know, while I'm penciling it, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to have to make this bark a weird color in order to make this feel really alien, you know? So, yeah, I mean, and like even on this page one thumbnail, uh, the last panel, I have instructions to myself, reverse this shot because I'm breaking a, a, a personal rule here is that I try to get my final panel on all my pages to move out, uh, away from the, the spine of the book, okay. right? So but, it's about the page flip and whatnot, um, anticipating the next moment sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. I just try not to have any – on the final panel, just to create a sense of flow and a natural sense of, oh, it's time for me to turn the page, I try to have the action always pointing towards the bottom right corner of the page. That's just a personal rule. I think I've heard other people say that that's a good thing to do, too. Um, I don't think it's a hard and fast rule. It's just when I did the thumbnail, I was trying to create like a sense of visual rhythm on the page, and it felt natural for the characters to be moving toward the tree to create a sense of we're moving deeper into the woods. But then I thought at the last minute, nah, you know, that really should be flipped. They should be moving in the other direction. I'll still have that sense of depth, and but I'll get to follow my rule of the page flip. Um, but instead of like redrawing it, I know how to reverse this shot. <laughs> I'll just put reverse shot in there, and it's it's fine, you know. So, but like if you look at the thumbnails on panel uh, page two of the Equalizers of the Divide, you can see that I didn't even bother putting in the background in pa panel two. It's like they're in the woods. I'll I'll figure that part out when I get to the final pen pencils here. I'm just drawing shrubs and trees. I don't need to do any reference for that. So. It's really wild that that. Um... In the same presentation, that this is all uh, your art style is is a is a consistent you know uh, growing thing, but at the same time the uh, the style your your method for breaking up this task is so different. You know, like like you mentioned, you reverse the shot. I mean, I would guess that you would have drawn that at least two or three more times <laughs> back in the yeah back when I was working on the front, I totally would have. I would have drawn it a couple more times. But at this point, I felt... And this is this is something we talked about in some past episodes. It, this was at the point where I started making some mistakes in my career, is I felt like I was finally getting a command over my storytelling abilities. I really understood what I was doing, and I could do these things intentionally, and I could intellectually defend all of my choices if somebody asked me. Um, and that that's when I started taking on too many darn things, because everything became exciting, and I suddenly had this sense of, oh, I can do that, I can do that. This is different than when I said, I can do that when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I was like, I can do that, you know, how hard can it be? This was, I can do that because I know it. I know because I've done it before, and now I'm going to do even more. Now that I've conquered this thing, I want to do even bigger things, right? So, right? so, yeah, I was trusting myself a lot more as a storyteller at this point by doing less at the thumbnail level, but I was still penciling super tight. I mean, these are tight pencils. My God, yes. I mean that those pencils. I would say a lot of people would go straight from that to coloring. Um, just do a little bit of a uh, little bit of uh, adjustment in Photoshop or, or your favorite, uh, you know, bitmap app. Maybe even vectorize it. Um, mm -hmm. Cause a little bit of smoothing if, if you needed that. Um, yeah. Or, or thought it out. Um, Technique that once in a while I'll notice various artists on Twitter talking about saying, <clears throat> you know, I just tightened up my pencils enough where I go straight from that to coloring. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they may do color holds on the lines or whatnot or, or not. And, and just by adjusting the, the, the darkness, causing it to be black. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and what's funny is that's what I did when I was starting out because I was afraid of ink. But having learned how to ink now, I'm actually fascinated by the character that traditional inking gives my pencils. So what I do now is, I mean, and there's a video that maybe we can link to. Um, I did a, a tutorial on how to um, convert graphite pencils to non-photo blue for printing onto Bristol. Did we talk about this before? I think we did. Um, uh, we might have. I mean, this is maybe in our first episode. Maybe. I don't think so, though. Okay. I, I remember talking about it recently with somebody. But anyway, yeah, I, there's a really simple way in both Adobe Photoshop and Photoshop Elements. Those are the only two programs I use, sadly. Sorry, I don't know how to do it in Painter or Manga Studio Pro yet. 
but uh, you can scan your graphite pencils, and this is what I do, is I scan my graphite pencils, and then I print them out in non-photo blue so that I can ink them, and if I screw up, I can always print out another batch of pencils. So this is why, to this day, I still have these pencils from Equalizers of the Divide. And quick note, Sarah Turner inked these, not me. So this is another reason why I saved the pencils, because it would be expensive to mail them to her, and uh, when I could just send her a digital file that she can print out in non-photo blue. Anyway, um, you know, I, I think that that's what makes inking that much more interesting is the fact that you don't have to anymore. Now it becomes even more of an art form, right? Because uh, you could just translate the pencils or, you know, it would be interesting to take one of my books and print a pencil version, like tighten up the pencils in Photoshop like you were describing, and then one where I inked it because they do look different. And I like that kind of um, serendipity that you get out of inking uh, traditionally you know, with, with actual analog tools and not having any undos, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a different mindset. I, I'd experimented a lot with that this year with uh, all four mini comic projects I worked on. I used different approaches on each of them to an extent, but um, uh, except for one, actually, come to think of it, uh, yeah, using uh, various kinds of brush pens, and I ended up landing on the, uh, the Pentel, um, Pentel pocket brush pen, which, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody, you know, there was a parade for this thing. And there's a reason. It's pretty darn awesome. It eats my ink like a, like a remorseless eating machine, but it, uh, it's, it feels sweet while it's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it, was neat. it was neat for me to experience. There's no undos. There's a different mindset. Yeah. You just kind of, you're experiencing your art in a, in a far different way, which I find pretty fun. Yeah, and and sometimes you get those happy accidents of, uh, oh, I didn't mean to do that, and if you were doing it digitally, you would instantly do the command Z or control Z, right, out of, oh, I hated that, no, but when you mess it up and you get another chance to look at it, sometimes you go, oh, I'm glad I did that, you know, that worked out. That happened, that happened to me a lot when I was learning the crow quill, is I learned to expect rogue lines to occur on the page that worked out even better than I had, had in intended. I mean, maybe it was like 10% of the time or something. I don't know. I, I don't really have a chart for this. But it, it happened at a regular enough interval that I, be I started to look forward to it happening. And I began to rely on that being a part of the process that delighted me. It kept it fun for me. So, so yeah, there's the uh, thumbnails next to the final page. And it, it evolved quite a bit in like two steps, right? So... And then, oh, and then I close with, um, there's a thumbnail from a new book I'm working on, and it's even, it's maybe, you know, it's it's tighter than the, the stuff I did when I was a kid, but it's still pretty darn loose. And this I'm doing, um, I take 8.5 by 11 paper, cut it in half, portrait style. Is that right? Portrait, yeah. So it becomes a piece of paper that is, what, four and a quarter inches wide by 11 inches deep. Fold that in half, and then I thumbnail at this size. And this goes back to something you're talking about in terms of compromises. Because I've decided that this project, I want to run it with uh, the sugary, here's a scoop. I'm running this on sugary cereals. I'm going to start getting some content on there again. And uh, I want to get this comic, what? That's a big scoop. Yeah, uh, <laughs> worth highlighting. So sugary cereals will be starting up again. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm doing this for. Um, and I want the comic to be read by kids. And I think the only way that kids are going to be reading this comic series is if I make it so that it works well on mobile devices. So you talked before about a primary, secondary, tertiary platform. What are you planning? Where are you planning this comic to go? What are going to be the chief reading experiences? So in the case of the front, when I did it online, it's like, well, I'm putting it online as a secondary thing. This was the primary delivery mechanism that I had envisioned for it. But I also put it on the web because I want people to discover it and love it. But it's not an ideal reading experience reading this aspect ratio on a computer screen. Or it looks fine on one of these screens, um, but it's tiny, right? You know, there's a lot of dialogue on there. you got to pinch to zoom and all that stuff. And, not not so fun. Looks great on an iPad though. Uh, but I want I want this to be this this Holly Hammerhand's book uh, to be its first reading experience is meant for mobile 
and then it looks great on an iPad, it looks great on a web page, um, and then I'll print it. Casey and I have talked about printing it as a book, so it would be roughly half the size, height-wise, of a, of a traditional manga-sized graphic novel. And this with uh, Casey Van Heights of wintersinlabelle.com. Thank you. Yes. I did that terrible thing that people do. Where like, oh, yeah, I was talking to Denny the other day. Who's Denny? <sighs> Casey Van Heis of wintersinlavelle.com, space case with a K on the Twitters. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the evolution of my uh, style of doing thumbnails. Um, but you know what? I mean, I've told... Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just, as, a, as a closing note, uh, in my classrooms when I'm dealing with adults who are not, not very comfortable with the whole drawing part, uh, and it, especially what I find interesting is that a beginning artist has a really hard time being rough and loose, right? They always go to their drawing as the final drawing. We all did that. Um, you, you, you throw each line down very deliberately because you want this piece to be the finished thing. You don't want to do a series of drafts leading up to the thing. Um, I just did that, that again, the thing and the thing. Uh, so I tell them, I'm like, well, okay, if that's, if that's your hurdle, you know, you got to conquer it eventually. But in the meantime, to get stuff done, take pictures, you know? Uh, the comic Ex Machina by, oh, I can never remember the, the artist and writer of that series, but it's a, it's a well-known comic in the, in the direct market uh, provinces. Um, that guy used photographs to uh, pre -vis all of his scenes. And in the back of one of the collections of the Ex Machina book, um, he actually shows the photos w uh, next to the panels. Like, here's, here's how I pre I had my friends do all the poses, and then here's how I turn it into the story. And actually, that's my understanding how, um, was it, uh, uh, Brian O'Malley did uh, Scott Pilgrim. Uh, no way. Yep. Yeah. Uh, took photographs of real places. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Castle, for example, uh, the name of the Wow, looking at my newer stuff and then going and then scrolling back to this, it, it does look pretty raw. <laughs> I see why the publishers turned me down. Oh, that stuff's ragged. It got a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And viewing what you did before and, and seeing the progression. And what's what's wild is uh, the progression hasn't led to sort of a uh, Sort of a feedback loop of like, oh, I'm doing this thing, so I'm going to do it louder and harder. I'm this, I'm doing this thing, I'm going to do it louder and harder, and it just keeps, you know, emphasizing one technique. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, you seem to be uh, looping back and picking different things from different stages, and all of a sudden leading to Holly Hammerhands, where it looks um, cartoony style, and uh, for cartoony style, it's it's uh, it's accurately thumbed but it also is um, just objectively loose as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing I noticed, too, is about like how your, your style will evolve, not only in terms of the immediate visuals, but uh, in terms of what you do on the page. Like One of the things that, I really, that caught me off guard when I was looking at Stranger Things is how, what a slave to the grid I was. Like All the pages are grid style. All the pages are square panels. I don't really play with design on the page at all. Uh, and I, and I, can, I can report that I certainly wasn't thinking about using the elements within the panels as a compositional element. I was not thinking that, that complexly yet. Uh, I, was just, I was just trying not to drown, drawing the thing. But by the time I get to working on the front, you can see that like here's a page where uh, Galen is leaping up to the window and Dick is firing this laser gun at him. And I, I start playing a lot of tricks in terms of composition, using the, um, the laser blast and the sound effect as uh, opposing elements, right? To create like a sense oh, like a... I, in interesting ways that, I mean, there's just energy flowing all over the freaking place here. It's wild. And then how the laser beam goes from panel one, two, three, three, four, moves into panel five to become a separate moment to make us reflect on the fact that the laser beam is heading towards the ground. So when we get to the, next, the following page, we make that connection that when that explosion happens behind Hook, that's because Dick, Dick's laser uh, you know, didn't hit Galen, but hit the floor. Um, but, then, but then also, yeah, like, uh, right, like looking at this page where um, Max is 
flying up towards the Brigadier General as he flies away, and I do a lot of panel border breaking, different kind of panel borders, panel shapes, create, using a like, line to really emphasize moments like when Max crashes into the car, there's a big thick black border around there. So I got a lot more playful with my actual composition and paneling at this stage in my career and really not feeling so addicted to the grid. And then when I got to doing equalizers, I got even more playful where we look at this first page, which is, I'm really proud of this page. Uh, I don't mind talking about this one ad nauseum because I just like how I knitted together this element where in panel one, Ren is looking at the vista. Panel two, the characters are interacting with Ren in the tree as she looks at panel one. And then the, the tree becomes a compositional element guiding our eye down to panel three as the characters move off the page. So I started thinking a lot more about like, okay, what can I do with this page that only comics can do? I'm always trying to think of that stuff. So, and you know, one of the challenges of doing thumbnails this size, like this this half of like about a quarter of an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper size, is in, in knowing that it's going to have to be four panels or less per page because I'm dealing with smaller screen real estate and trying like optimizing this for a mobile phone or an iPod touch kind of deal. Uh, there's a whole new challenge in trying to play those tricks. So. Anyway. Sure, it's, uh, so do you find that uh, over time, the, the, the nuances you picked up on the art form, the things that you liked, sort of this creative vocabulary has, uh, uh, Has it become a uh, sort of this, this thing that you always have to live up to and it's a stressful, like, measuring stick yeah. kind of thing? I mean, you mentioned, obviously, you know, you're teaching and whatnot, so you want to live up to it. And it's like, yep, I'm not just, you know, teaching this. I can do it. But, like, just what about the, just the techniques that you like and, yeah. and appreciate? Um, you peeled back so many layers of the onion, and, and now you know they're there. They're there. Yeah. So, and that's what I was – yeah, that's, that's another – reason to point out that it actually gets I would say harder the, the better you get at it because you want to like this is what I posted about I posted this in a blog post uh, on comicsagreat.com I think it's comicsagreat.com slash hollyhammerhands04 and I actually posted an update of some of the thumbnails I'm working on and one of the things that happens to me emotionally every time I'm thumbnailing a book without fail I can't escape it is two thirds of the way in, I begin to doubt that this is any good. You know, I'm I'm I got tunnel vision on, I got the blinders on, I'm focused on just finishing this thing, and I'm gonna back away a hundred feet and look at it, and it's gonna be a mess. It's gonna be garbage, and everybody's gonna see me for what I really am—a fraud. And the only way I've ever been able to get through these things is a deadline. The deadline's looming. Just get it done. Just finish it for crying out loud. You don't have you don't have the luxury of crying publicly about this thing. Um. And then when I finish it, I back away 100 feet, and I'm like, oh, that's nice, that's nice, and that's... I did, like, three cool things here, and it wasn't in the front of my mind when I was doing it. I was just being playful on the page, right? So there's a page in, in this Holly Hammerhands book where I, I played a trick that just occurred to me by accident. You know, I was faced with the, the, the situation of... Well, I guess I could show it. Um, I was faced with the situation of having to do an establishing shot of the school when the girls arrive at the school while having a conversation that is a little bit of an expositional scene leading up to some things that are going to happen later, right? And so what I did was this little thing where I show the school and then the panels are inset in the school and they're re referring to this character here and they're looking at him from the panels as they talk about it to like keep our eye regarding this. So this is all kind of happening simultaneously to these four moments as this kid's walking on these school grounds, right? And when I did it at the time, it was a moment of desperation. It's like, how am I going to work all this? I got five panels to figure out how to get squeeze them all into this space and have all this conversation happening. Um, and then I did that, and then I look at it, you know, a couple days later, I'm like, hey, that was cute. I'm glad I did that. But, but yeah, you feel the pressure because you did every time you do a cool thing and it's like when you put on a personal challenge on yourself like I want to invent something every time I make a book um, you can't but you still try to and that makes it more stressful overall right it, it creates one more layer of stress that takes a little bit of the fun out of it but it also creates a sense of challenge to it too it's like are you going to jump rope because you want to sing my mother punched your mother right in the nose hot peppers hot peppers or are you going to jump rope because you're getting into shape for a big fight right I don't know yep. That make any sense? That was that was a bad metaphor. Um, well, 
you know, some people uh, jump rope and have have a good time, even though they're about to jump into a fight. I that's know. true. Um, now, Ideally, I, you do both. But that's how it works, though. When you're when you're chewing on this stuff and 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 uh, you know, thinking about what you learned and how it's like helping you and hamstringing you at the same time, because now you you know more about the problem. Yeah. And, uh, no. Uh, expect more out of yourself and all that. Um, but at the same time, that's kind of awesome. Uh, but what? Okay, so I, I, what I'm curious about is is um, do you shop for like one thing I saw like I mentioned uh, Brian Lee O'Malley, Byron mm -hmm. or you know Brian Lee O'Malley, right? Yeah. And uh, the uh, you know Scott Pilgrim, etc. Uh, one thing I, I saw in his Flickr stream ages ago, um, I visited a couple times, and he would do these critiques of of uh, word balloon flow and like uh, try to make his page flow optimized as much as possible for a pleasurable reading experience. Yep. And I mean, hardcore really uh, beat himself up if he hit it or if he didn't get it to where he thought it would be. And not, not like flogging in public or whatever, but like really, I mean, when I would look at a page and think that's laid out pretty well, but he would have a deeper vocabulary and, and, and really be harshly critiquing himself and saying, no, it's going to flow like this. And, you know, doing the Z over here, it kind of gets people stuck in the corner and, and I want it to just kind of have this arc and sort of where you end on the end, last page, and you want to turn and see what's next. And um, anyway, uh, so I saw that, and I think, ah, mm, I think I found a technique I want to do to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm 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 gonna pull up a, I'm gonna pull up an image where that yeah I I sweat this a lot. Um, your documents. Where's my computer? I put it on the desktop, I think. Oh, yeah, I did. And I know I've talked about this page before in the past, but it's a good page. This is another one of those ones where I, I beat something and I feel really good about it, so I don't mind talking about it over and over and over again. Um, this is a page from Switch Runners that I did with Mark Rudolph. And in this, this, in this particular situation, this was the first time where I worked on a comic with somebody where I let them handle the thumbnails. Normally, this was in my, this was in my wheelhouse. This is my, you know... Uh, place of expertise uh, where I can lend the most value. And so I thought, as a creative challenge, I'm going to hand the reins over to somebody else, and I'm going to do my best to do what Tom did for me, where I'm just going to just one paragraph describe essentially what has to happen on the page. And because it was my first time, I kind of blasted the doors off of what could be achieved on a page because I wasn't I, I forced myself to not think about visualizing it I said okay page three these essential things happen so in this this particular uh, instance I said okay the characters are monitoring on the computer that uh, there's something weird happening and that needs to be investigated they radio the guy who's in the field in this little uh, space car uh, he refuses to go because he's going to do something else, and so the leader has to take two other members of his team and issue them vehicles so that they can go investigate instead. So Mark put this together for me, where, you know, they, they panel one, they detect the weird energy signature, and uh, panel two, the the leader puts his other two team members out and uh, to assigns them vehicles. And Mark did this trick where he has like this little computer screen pop up pointing to the characters saying, uh, you know, this is Rondo, he's going to take this vehicle, and here's a schematic or like a wireframe of the vehicle on like the, the 1980s green computer screen, right? Um, and then he has the guy in, out in the field in the space car sort of intersecting with the panel, even though he's not there, and then their, their, their conversation ends, and then the leader points to, the, to his two uh, heroes and sends them out into the field. So... When you take the lettering off this page, it is really hard to read. It's really hard to know what the heck's going on. Is there a car in the room with those people? It seems to be sitting on the floor. <laughs> I don't know what's happening here. Do I go from like straight across the top, panel one, panel two, and then to that panel of the vehicle? Or do I go down to the picture that says Cicada with the, with the other vehicle? Where do I go? And in placing my word balloons, there's no question of where you go. You know, you know exactly where to go on this page because I knitted it together. This is like I penciled it, Mark inked it, and I think Mark, yeah, Mark colored it, and then I lettered it. And I am exceedingly proud of how I lettered this page because I found found a way to have the characters have this dialogue exchange and work it into where there's a real direction to where your eye's supposed to go. 
You know, because let's face it, what's the first thing you look at on a comics page? Most people, it's the word balloons. I would have to do some serious reflection. I don't know what the first thing I look at is. It's it could be word balloons. Um, I'm going to say for the casual reader, for the casual reader who doesn't think of a lot about drawing and art the way we do, like we creators, I think probably sure. the first place they're going to look. Words have so much contrast and recognizability, language that you're familiar with, and all that. Yeah, you know, I can see that making a lot of sense. But anyway, so yes, what to that was a very long way of saying that I agree with Brian Lee O'Malley that the 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 more the more skills you acquire at doing this kind of thing, the more you have to sweat because it's it's a it's a weird irony. You let, let me just say it too is that it's not like I'm not like really far into my career yet. I know I hope. <laughs> you know, God willing, a bus doesn't hit me tomorrow, and then this is the end of my career. But, you know, the the, the idea is that I'm, you know, only a little ways in as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I can report that you you do achieve a command over things, and things get easier to do. Like, drawing a hand is a lot easier today than it was five years ago. Um, but then, conversely, acquiring a bigger tool bag means that when you're like, well, what should I do in in this scene? You got a lot more things to rifle through to figure out which is the the right one to use, and you figure it out, but it's not without some sweating it. And sometimes it happens intuitively, instinctively, and from the back of the brain, uh, and that's always the best. That feels the best because you feel like you're a genius. Uh, but then sometimes you have to like you know really sweat it out. So I don't know. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. I'm curious. Uh, what is the the, the next thing you're sweating like what did what have you discovered that you've yet to use like you know sometimes when you you know you get that that new thing and you know I want to do that like I um, it's not trying to pat myself on the back or whatever but like for instance for 24 hour comic day I hadn't made a comic with manga studio and I said I'm manga studio on mm. 24 hour comic day this is a new tool and so it's a more literally a tool but like it could be an idea or anything that um, Especially if it's a if it's a part of your comic process, I'm curious. Like, what's that next thing that you're working to level up at, or whatever, or that you wish you could? Or, with yeah. with this particular project, there's there's two things, and they're not tool related. It's more of an like an abstract sort of like broader skill set kind of related thing. One is I really want there to be a clear emotional through line for my story. What I mean by that is is are the, the moments that I've chosen for this story, do they reflect the overall point of the character's emotional development? Okay, so it's, it's themes, but it's themes with a little bit more of a narrower laser beam focus. Instead of like broadcasting, don't do this or don't do that or do this or do that, it's how have I mapped on my lead character's emotions to the discovery of the theme? Have I done that? You know, uh, Something that feels a little bit more rich and robust than what I've in the past have done with my characters. I feel like I write fun characters, but I don't feel like I write really terribly rich characters. And I want to see if I can fit more richness into that smaller space that I've always worked in, right? I work in, I work in what I have coined, you know, the 80s cartoon style. And, you know, I've talked about that extensively. Um, and one of the values of that is that it's a two-dimensional character that you can sort of role-play onto. You know, they invite you to wonder more about them. But can I take it to one more level of complexity and really make this person feel a little bit more rich? That's one of the things. The other one is working with a new art style, a more cartoony, more exaggerated. Um, let's see if I can find a panel where I was really playing with that. Okay. Yeah, this one is the one I posted on my blog, right? Where can I push things so that it's even more exaggerated in a SpongeBob SquarePants kind of way, right? Playing within that kind of realm of exaggeration. Mm -hmm. So uh, can I do that without being derivative? Can I do that and have it feel like it's coming from my voice and I'm not just looking at, well, how did you know the guy who did Ren and Stimpy do it? How did the person who did that do it? Uh, can, can I bring my own take to that? Um, that's the next challenge that I'm taking on with this too. It's like exploring one more style and this is a comic that I want to be uh, right for young girls I want this to be to speak to 8 to 12 year old girls uh, 
So there's a challenge in that because I've always thought of my audience as being 12-year-old boys, 8-year-old boys, right? When I do all these like action-adventure things with explosions and whatnot, I wanted to do a, the, the challenge with Holly Hammerhands that Casey and I set out to do is can we do a superhero story and make it palatable and accessible to young girls? That's uh, that would be very challenging. <laughs> it, it's uh, I, I it sounds like um, you've done something that I would for sure do is, is partner with a female. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Casey and I have a lot of shared enthusiasm for this. Uh, you know, one of one of my dream projects, one of the projects I'd most love to do is do a comics adaptation of Pippi Longstocking because she's one of my favorite literary characters. Uh, and so this was an, an opportunity to write something in what I, uh, an attempt to get into that vein, you know, like a uh, magical powered girl with super strength who has a different outlook on life uh, because she comes from a very different place uh, and teaches us something while she's learning something herself kind of deal, that kind of thing. Um, sure. So... And, and Casey wanted to, you know, she, she, she made it clear that she wanted to do something where the heroine isn't necessarily what we call beautiful, you know. Let's show young girls that a variety of body types exist in this world, and uh, you can be a hero or somebody to admire and not have a traditional, you know, L magazine body type, right? Exactly. So... Yeah, but there's still gonna be there's gonna be like actual superhero superheroes in this too. This will be the first time I've ever written like traditional superheroes. That, that comes up in Act Three. But uh, anyway, it's a, it's a it's a super cool story. I'm super excited about it. I'm super excited about doing new sugary cereal stuff. But but yeah, this thing is fraught with challenges because I'm working in uh, a genre that I'm not terribly comfortable in. I'm trying to invent some genre within this genre, and I'm working in a style I'm not used to. I've been developing, but I don't, you know, I don't feel like I've got total command of that. I'm working in a format and aspect ratio that I'm is new, uh, but that's why you do it. Yeah, you really stacked a few <laughs> challenges in front of you. I mean, it's boring that's... otherwise. Yeah, like you said, you don't want to just just now. I'm going to do it louder and faster. You know, that that's a perfect description of what a lot of cartoonists do, and that and that scares you know that seriously that scares the hell out of me. The idea of finding myself in that cycle. I don't ever want to find myself there. It's not going to be fun anymore. Of, uh, doing the same thing. Well, uh, yeah, that's uh, it, it. It's a. Uh, I totally respect it. It's it's really hard to do. Um, I think uh, I'm I'm definitely going to be working it, it toward adding those kinds of goals to my, to my uh, next project as well. Not just. Uh, not just do the same. And so, what? well, for me, I, I was actually thinking of saving this idea for a, a Polytechnic cast, but uh, as far as looking at art, you know, your, your process and what you what you produce as a, uh, you know, you've got your, your, your tools and what you're familiar with, and um, uh, I took, in taking on challenges, sometimes the, the, the 24-hour comic day, I didn't finish, right? Mm -hmm. I think I, I succeeded in getting the, the, the one of the noble failure kind of things where I got 10 pages completely inked. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's... When I was thinking about, well, what do I care about now as an artist versus last year? Because last year I finished. And um, and I think it's kind of like that when I whenever I face a new project. Well, what do I care about now? And what do I want to bring to it? And what do what do I have in my tools that that are going to that's going to serve me? And and, and what's what's not or what's missing? Mm -hmm. And uh, and sometimes it's literally a tool. Like I, I've had I have this big curiosity for Manga Studio that I'm getting some. And but what, one of the biggest things is is figuring out uh, using story as a complete way of 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 transmitting emotion and experience and less uh, hit, hiddenness, right? Because, and, and so I, I see that in my comics I've produced and how, how uh, up and down and hit and miss it is. Well, I'll have a strong story arc for seven episodes and I'll kind of have a 
more murky situation and, and not really convey the characters that strongly and emotionally and whatnot. Anyway, it's, uh, it's always an interesting dialogue that I have with myself, and I think everyone has some kind of flavor of that. Mm -hmm. the, uh, what, what's, what's this next project going to be like? What do I want it to be? And uh, so one of the things with like 24-hour comic day that it was, um, now I don't have to record this plug Technicast, is that, that uh, I decided I just didn't want to do it for the sake of doing it. I cared about like the end result. And I think you can, like I, I believe like at some point I will achieve a level of, of uh, creative development and comic visual art skill that I'll be able to do a, a story that, that can resonate with me and I feel will resonate with someone out there. That So those ideas are being communicated, but they're also um, produced in a way that uh, has the good word balloon flow, has the kind of paneling and pacing that I want, has the character development that I need for what I'm trying to achieve and all that. Yeah. Um, but I knew I couldn't do it this year. So I decided, I, I shifted, and I said, I'm not going to win it. I'm not going to get across that finish line and feel that win. I decided to feel a different win. So, so it's like a situation where you couldn't dunk, but you got good fundamentals? The old, the old woman's oh, basketball yeah. joke? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, exactly. That's the, um, yeah, the, the um, Futurama when they're yeah. on the... Yeah. Well, they're on the woman planet, the Amazon planet, yeah. That's a pretty awesome episode. <laughs> well, it's got um, B. Arthur saying, de or not, is it B. Arthur? Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah, yeah Death Snoo. by Snoo Snoo. Death by Snoo Snoo, yeah. Any, um, yeah. It, uh, anyway, it, they, I don't know, I heard, heard a lot of that kind of thing when you were, you were describing it. And it reminded me of that, you know, the, that, puzzle I had at 24 hour comic day and I thought you know what I know I can do I can do the, the thing like I always done I could do this louder and faster and whatever but am I going to care about it and it's not in not that day when I sat down that day I didn't care about that I cared right. about trying to tell a story so yeah yeah I mean and, and you want to create okay here's another thing to put in perspective is that I showed off these couple pages that I'm like actually proud of Right. Like I, when I show this stuff, like we're looking at now, we're looking at that Stranger Things thing again. It's like I look at it, I'm like, eh, you know, it was OK for what it was. Uh, but am I going to go like, look at what I did with this? No. You know, I'll post on my blog. People can look at it if they want to. Uh, but I'm not going to walk around with it in a folder, you know, to show people. Um, those, those two pages in particular, the Switch Runners page and the uh, Equalizers of the Divide page. You have to remember, put it in context. Those are both from 16 to 24 page stories. So one out of 24 is going to be the one where I go, like, this is the thing I learned. This is the thing that I, I, I conquered a thing that was really important to me to conquer. The rest of the story is, like, it's good. I, I, Equalizers of the Divide, number one, is a good book. I feel satisfied with the way that story came together. Um, but getting a good story is, is, like, the main goal. And then as a sub-goal, I set up for myself, what is, like, a creative challenge I want to take on? and beat this time. That is not going to be important to the general public at large. That page one of Equalizers, nobody's ever congratulated me on that, like, offhand. Nobody's read the book at a convention going, like, this is clever what you did here. You know, it, it, it's just something that I get to feel per personal satisfaction about and get to blab about on a podcast like this. But uh, the main thing is just to tell an interesting story that you feel satisfied with, and then hopefully, if you get lucky, you'll beat a couple challenges along the way. Um, and actually, I think that you wind up beating a lot of challenges just through the, the simple act of doing it in general, right? Because you're, you're, you're slowly building your tool set in an invisible way by just cranking out pages. The big achievements come every once in a while, and then you get to feel sat that sense of satisfaction. But then it's, it's, it's a fleeting satisfaction, because then who, who the hell cares? <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, I think if I go to... Uh, oh, it's, like, it's like I was at a, a workshop a couple days ago where a kid said to me, he's like, oh, you got a YouTube show. And I said, yeah, it's on uh, YouTube.com slash comics are great. And that's actually where you can get the Lean Into Art videos. And he said, uh, how many hits you got? And I was like, oh, a couple hundred apiece, you know, 500 for one episode. He's like, no offense, that's not very much. You know, to the general public, our accomplishments don't always look so good. And that's another thing to remember. 
you know, but in the context, right, hour-long show, 500 people gave that a listen and watched, like, a bunch of talking heads. That's pretty cool, you know, but... It rocks. Yeah, I, I, I am very happy to play to a, um, a group of people that share this, this interest enough that are willing to dive into it to this extent, and then especially when they want to uh, converse back with us and whatnot. Yeah. Um, that is... Uh, I appreciate both. I appreciate just, you know, watching and whatnot, but uh, the ideal for me is to, to somehow call the next. Yeah. And I hear um, you. Speaking of that, Jersey, um, do you, uh, did you want to mention, I mean, we've been talking about that quite a bit. So the What's next that? evolution of uh, some of our Lean Into Our casts, we may be actually doing a little bit more with uh, getting others involved. Oh, yeah, we can throw a hint out about that and see if anybody responds to it. Um, so, so yeah, like this crazy Adobe Connect software that we record the show through has a feature where I can go to Pods, Share, Add New Share, and I can create a new whiteboard. And the cool thing is that we can go to town on it and we can get like a different pen. This is really interesting for people who are listening in the audio, but you'll just have to imagine in your head that there's a big white screen on the screen, and I can start drawing things on it, like a man running, and Rob's drawing a, what looks like a building, oh, he's drawing a background for me, <laughs> a man running into a building, and then I'm going to draw a mean guy, big nose, thing. You can't do that. Anyway, so there's this, this collaborative software where you can, um, everybody can draw. So if, like we were talking about, this thing, this, this uh, software totally has the ability to broadcast our shows and take it live. And maybe once in a while do a live show where people can show up and participate via chat or even chime in with audio if they have like something that they really are super enthusiastic about, enthusiastic about sharing. Uh, and then we could even close with some like group drawing, like a jam comic activity kind of like thing, like what we're doing right now, where we're working together to draw a thing. Exactly. So some of it could be um, just the being present while we while we are recording, and if that sounds fun to you, to you know be part of the live, awesome. Uh, to do some participation via the chat room, and you know, like Jersey mentioned, the audio. I mean, we have a um, with our, our current setup with Adobe, I think we can have like 25 people or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember reacting to Jersey's. Uh, um, so maybe we shouldn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that exactly, but that's part of the point. Is when we're when, when we're interacting with others, uh, there's going to be a change. Um, and that it's sort of. Uh, you know, telling a joke, and if, if people react, and then you react to them reacting, and then they realize that they're a part of the experience, right? True. Yeah. I'll draw a kitty cat. <laughs> um, this could be a fun way to make uh, album art for the episodes, too. <laughs> Let's not use this one, okay? <laughs> because this looks like a... Uh, what kind of visual storytellers are these guys? Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's a whole lot. Uh, my cat can draw better than that. And yeah. Concern people may have, but uh, you know what? Uh, we're having fun. Anyway, um, it, it'll be different, and we're we're looking forward to experimenting with that. So, uh, some of that, like Jersey said, if we can do like this this jam with the whiteboard, and uh, and then but then again, just in general, like we're talking, and someone, you know, like mentions a, a comic artist, and and you 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 realize, oh, I have this idea about about you know uh, something that they did that you guys didn't mention and oh, great throw it in the chat and we'll mm -hmm. have exactly it and we'll bring it up. yeah it it'll be fun you want to take advantage of that definitely so if anybody has any uh, in, in input on that and this it sounds like we're wrapping up and I think we should because I think we've been going almost two hours again <laughs> uh, if anyone wants to give us any input on that, you can follow us on Twitter at Le Lean Into Art on Twitter. Our email is leanintoart at gmail.com. Lean 
And uh, there's a contact page on leanintoart.com, right? Yes, there is. Uh, there's a link in the footer of all our pages. You can uh, feedback and questions and stuff. Yeah, let us know if you would if you would participate in something like that, and then we'll look at the calendar and see when we could do a, some live shows. Okay, well, good talk, Rob. I think that was. I, I, sorry, I kind of bogarted the whole episode, um, but you get the next no, one. Oh, this is good. We delve deep into your your uh, your thumbnail process, which, uh, um, yeah. Who knows? This is a deep topic. We can revisit it uh, anytime in the future or whatever. I thought it rocked. So thanks for putting together this presentation. And yeah, for uh, what it was. It, it's some incentive to check out the video too, right? I mean, yeah. it's not just uh, Zod and Neo hanging out, <laughs> which is fun for a little bit. But uh, <laughs> we've got a good uh, good presentation here for you to um, check. Yep, and that'll be included in the post at leanintoart.com. So just click the podcast link if you don't see it in the blog feed if you're listening to this way after the fact. So, okay. Um, thanks for downloading and listening, everybody. And uh, a few days left to take advantage of the random unlock at leanintoart.com. We're adding a uh, an hour of open office time where you can talk to either me or Rob. Uh, for every new sign-up we get leading up to November 1st when we launch 30 classes in 30 days. Information is at lean into, leanintoart.com. Link will be put in the show notes for this episode. So uh, if you're listening before November 1st, still time left. Uh, and uh, I guess nothing left to say except until next time. I've been Jersey Drozd of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of interactive-storyteller.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. And of course, we're both at leanintoart.com as well. That's true. So, okay, bye.